So one of the most common treatment modalities for sickle cell disease is the use of red blood cell transfusions. Matt, um, can you share with us, you know, how do we use transfusions in sickle cell disease? What are the indications for simple, chronic, um, intermittent uh, transfusions? And what are the potential risks and benefits of using transfusions? Sure, so transfusion is a very important uh, aspect of the therapy of sickle cell disease, but it has to be used appropriately. I sort of think of it as in the acute therapy or in the chronic therapy, and we'll discuss those a little bit uh, individually. So th the patients with sickle cell generally are quite anemic, and there can be accentuated times of anemia. Um, the patients are very reliant on the robust uh, red blood cell production by the bone marrow to accommodate for the uh, shortened red cell lifespan. And so there are certain um, times when that red cell production is attenuated, whether it be related to viral infections, classically parvovirus or others, where the patient will need a transfusion because their anemia is lower than even their low baseline. Mm -hmm. um, there are other times when acute transfusions or intermittent transfusions are used, particularly to prepare patients for surgery um, or to pair, uh, prepare patients for other um, uh, clinical interventions. Um, on the, the patients over time, uh, for other reasons for acute uh, treatment, uh, really the big one probably would be acute chest syndrome. Um, again, as was alluded to by one of the panelists, uh, is uh, the leading cause of death in both adults and children with sickle cell disease. And uh, it can be, uh, this, uh, the process of acute chest syndrome can be um, ended with a simple transfusion or in some cases the need to do an exchange transfusion to provide more normal hemoglobin A for the patient. On the chronic transfusion side, um, there really is only uh, one indication and that's for stroke prevention, whether it be primary stroke prevention or secondary stroke prevention. Um, we don't tend to use chronic transfusion for the indications of uh, pain. Um, that would be one, uh, typically that's not what we use. It's often a secondary intent mm -hmm. uh, of a transfusion, but really the only uh, clearly indicated chronic transfusion, monthly transfusion to suppress the amount of sickle hemoglobin is for stroke prevention. Um, and uh, some patients uh, will uh, be treated with a brief period of monthly transfusions, uh, maybe after severe acute chest syndrome to allow the lung to heal, but for the most part, uh, we really relate that to, to, to stroke prevention. So uh, transfusions are very useful, but have to be used carefully. Uh, in the United States, for the most part, um, blood donors are of the ethnicities which are not commonly affected by sickle cell disease, and there are minor blood group antigen differences that can lead to allosensitization or the patient creating an antibody towards the donor's minor blood group antigens. And for that reason, it's very important when considering transfusing a patient to not only do the typical cross-match of ABO and RH compatibility, but also to do an extended cross-match if available. And in many centers, uh, patients will actually have their red blood cell antigens genotype, so they're able to do even a much broader uh, matching for patients. And then the other complications are just like in any other patient. You can have acute uh, transfusion reactions, whether they be allergic, hemolytic, uh, um, febrile reactions, and those uh, are also potentially problematic. Um, in patients who are getting recurrent transfusions, of course, we worry about infections and uh, the, the concerns for HIV and hepatitis B, those are very uncommon nowadays in the times of screening, but there are new potentially bloodborne pathogens which are important in sickle cell disease every year. It's Eastern equine virus, West Nile virus, <laughs> Zika virus, <laughs> and in New England where we are, we worry about uh, tick diseases, so Babesia and the like, and a patient who's functionally asplenic will, will definitely cause uh, serious disease. But the biggest feared one, I think, uh, for all of us up here is allosensitization because you limit, uh, further limit the number of donors and that when a patient really needs a life-saving transfusion, they may not be able to get one. And the final complication of transfusion is with each unit of blood comes 250 milligrams of iron. And that uh, iron can accumulate in the body as a species. We don't have a way to get rid of iron, uh, except for a little hair loss, skin loss, and menstruation. And so this iron builds up in the body rather rapidly. And even an adult who's had intermittent transfusions, maybe one a year, over the course of a few decades, they can become significantly iron overloaded. And those, that iron tends to have a, a predilection for the, the liver and the, the uh, endocrine organs, the pituitary, the pancreas, and the thyroid uh, in particular. And this can lead to uh, added morbidities. And so looking at chelation, uh, pharmaceutical chelation, to remove that iron is also something that definitely needs to be kept in mind uh, for patients who have received a, a significant burden of transfusion. And it's also important to track how often and where they get transfused and communicate across institutional lines the type of blood that this person should be receiving, right? Have you had any experiences where that didn't happen and something went awry? So, you know, it's really interesting. It's um, a problem because there's no universal, just like we don't have a registry in sickle cell disease, there's actually no blo blood 
there's actually no blood registry that's universal. So it's really important we teach all our patients, first of all, to only get transfusions if they really need it. Because while it might alleviate the symptoms of a crisis, that could add additional morbidity if they get new antibodies, right? And also to make sure the blood bank knows how to transfuse them appropriately. And know that they have sickle cell disease. And knows that they have sickle cell disease and knows that if they're usually treated at this hospital, you should call this hospital's blood bank because they can have antibodies that then don't show up the next time. And I would say that I think it warrants repeating the, the concept that uh, an acute pain crisis is not treated with a blood transfusion. Yeah. And so going back to what you're saying that, again, asking your patients, when did you get your last transfusion so that you can at least have this uh, you know, discussion with the patient themselves because I so many times have patients saying, Dr. Shaw, you know, they were trying to give me a transfusion, but you gave me that talk mm -hmm. about how I need to be concerned and I said no. <laughs> about iron over, and they said no, right, right. So I think uh, again, I think it's a misunderstanding, and I think that with, with uh, you know ongoing education by the patients and the family, but also by the providers to, to understand that there are strict guidelines to give the transfusions for all the reasons that Matt you know, discussed. And you know, that's really also important because I've had patients say, you know, I refused the transfusion. You told me not to get it, but the doctor got mad at me, yeah. or the doctor said, well, all you want is pain medicine. And the truth was that I knew that I could get treated for my pain without a transfusion, and you'd said that was really important. So to really encourage providers as well to, to, to reserve those transfusions for acute chest syndrome um, and to really make sure you're matching them correct. Because there may come a time when they need it and they have 15 antibodies and nobody in this world has available blood that matches the um, phenotype and they cannot get transfusion. That has actually caused death in some patients. And so, Bray, have you, share with us an experience that you've had around communicating around transfusions, in-state, out-of-state, where they go, because I think it's important for us to highlight how important it is that people track where they got their last transfusion, where the samples were, where they documented antibodies, and why that's important mm -hmm. if they go to a different location right. to get care. Well, I, I will tell you at our center, um, when we see a new, a new patient, an important part of our history is the transfusion history, and we ask them every single hospital they think they've been transfused in during their lifetime. And our blood bank actually calls every single one of those hospitals uh, to ask if that patient has ever uh, shown evidence of an antibody. Um, and I think it's that kind of investigative work that protects patients. We would like to be able to tell our patients about all their antibodies, but quite honestly, it's very hard for them at, with this chronic disease and with some of the cognitive deficits to, to maintain knowledge of all, uh, that level of detail. Um, there are programs, including ours, that give patients or caregivers um, copies of uh, all of their antibodies so they can keep it on a card in their wallet so that when they go to a new hospital, they can say, look, I've got all these antibodies. They may not be present at this time. They're a little tighter, um, but please don't give me any blood that's incompatible. Um, so it, it's, it's not easy. I wish we did have a registry, like Julie said, but we don't. Um, so we have, to do, we, have to do, we have to do it the hard way, but it's necessary. And it's important to know that they're chronically anemic. And so a hemoglobin of eight in a person with sickle cell SS is actually their baseline. And it's not a reason for a transfusion. If they're not symptomatic, you want to reserve that blood for when they really need it. And people have gone through a crisis, gone down to six, and they've come back up to eight without blood, and they did just fine. And so I think defining the indication for transfusion is important. So are they symptomatic with tachycardia, hypo you know, hypoxemia, fainting spells, you know, et cetera, low blood pressure? that would be, or they have acute chest syndrome, that would be when you would consider giving a transfusion, but not just for a hemoglobin number per se. 